All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your night to participate in the second public workshop for the Westport and Dartmouth Route 6 corridor study. We've asked you all here tonight as Westport residents and stakeholders to present our findings so far and to discuss what issues and opportunities exist on Route 6 within your community. Our main goal of the evening is to get your input. My name is Gregory Girton. I'm a senior transportation planner here with SERPED and a co-lead on this study. Today, I'm joined by my fellow presenter, Sarah Brown, an, uh, a senior comprehensive planner here at SERPED and our assistant transportation planning director, Lisa Estrella Pedro. Um, I see that uh, we have a couple of public officials here, Representative Paul Schmidt and um, Jim Witten uh, from the planning board here. Um, just like to, to welcome you guys and um, ask if you'd like to um, provide any opening remarks before we get going. Yeah, this is uh, Jim Whiten from Westport. Uh, I'm on the planning board as well as uh, Bob Daler and uh, Manny uh, is here too, I believe. And I see Steve Ouellette is here. Um, so we are very anxious to see uh, and hear what you have here to present uh, as, as we discussed uh, in person with you and Lisa, that we need to really be careful with what we're doing here because we have so much uh, potential uh, going on at this moment. We're hoping that we could get some water and sewer in the Route 6 corridor. And uh, we are hoping to rezone some of Route 6 uh, to encourage some economic development. And we are certainly um, anxious to get a safer uh, traveled way and a place for bicycles as well. So lots of different uh, aspects to this and I hope uh, tonight will be instructive. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> All right. So our agenda for the evening is a simple one. We're gonna go over some details about the study and the study area. Then we will fill you in on the information and the data that we've collected via our stakeholder meetings and our research. And then the remainder of the meeting will be focused on your vision for Route 6 moving forward. And just so everyone knows this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the Westport and Dartmouth Route 6 corridor study webpage on SERPED's webpage. Um, if you require closed captioning, please click on the red and blue otter.ai button at the top left of your screen. A new window will appear with live closed captioning. We ask that all participants please remain muted and turn off your video until the activity and question and answer portion of the workshop. And to participate in the question and answer portion of the workshop, please select the raise hand function. You can find this by clicking on the participants button on the bottom of the screen, and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom. The presenters then call, will then call on participants. And you can also feel free to type a question or comment into the chat window, and we will address as many of those questions as we can during the Q&A and activities as well. If you are attending on your phone, you can use star six to toggle mute and star nine to raise your hand. Our study area begins at the Westport and Fall River City line and ends at Crossroad and Dartmouth. This entire section of Route 6 falls under Massachusetts Department of Transportation, MassDOT, jurisdiction. The primary study elements that we're gonna be focusing on in our corridor study are as follows. Bicycle and pedestrian safety and access to the corridor, along the corridor, and to the establishments located along the corridor. Safety for all road users along the corridor, in which we will take a deep dive into the crash data to uncover any and all common locations and themes for crashes within the study area. Transit, Route 6 is frequented by transit riders and we intend to assess how to best serve that population within the study area. Access, to ensure that all users of the roadway have a safe and pleasant experience along the corridor. And finally, congestion, 
Where are the choke points, if any? When do they occur? And what are some ways we can mitigate them? Uh, the timeline for the study is that the, the study should be concluded by late spring of next year. Um, and before we go any further, we'd like to learn a couple of things about you all tonight via some interactive poll questions. Oh. Having a small technical difficulty with our polls here. Well, we are going to skip over the polls for right now, and hopefully we can get those working uh, before the end of the presentation. Uh, apologize for that. Um, more on the study area. Um, so here are some key details about the study area. The study area is a total of 7.1 miles in length. There are a total of nine intersections along the corridor, four with traffic lights and five with stop signs. Route 6 is classified as an urban minor arterial or rural major collector, which means that Route 6 is considered a link between freeways and local streets, providing for the efficient collection, distribution, and transition of traffic among freeways, collector streets, local roadways, and property. There are four lanes of traffic along the corridor, along with a median separating the eastbound and westbound lanes. Sidewalks along the corridor are inconsistent, and where they do exist, they are mostly in poor condition with few exceptions, but more on that later. There are no bicycle facilities on Route 6. Although bicyclists are permitted to ride along the corridor, it's, it is unsafe considering the high speeds of traffic and the very width of shoulder. There are 56 transit stops serviced by Southeastern Regional Transit Authority, CERTA. These stops are nearly all exposed to the elements with only one poorly maintained bus shelter and some are placed dangerously close to the travel lanes. In August, we conducted stakeholder meetings for each municipality. The primary goal of these stakeholder meetings was to solicit input from town officials, MassDOT representatives, and other public representatives to ensure that their voices were heard early on in the process <clears throat> and to inform or direct some of the focus of our study. To capture stakeholder input, we conducted a SWOT analysis and a crowdsource mapping exercise. I'll review some of the highlights of those exercises with you now. SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, with strengths and weaknesses referring to the internal environment and opportunities and threats referring to the external environment. Participants provided a range of responses of which I've summarized on the slide. For strengths, we have wide lanes can make room for traffic calming. Many businesses are located along the corridor. Develop, there are many development and planning opportunities. And there are wide shoulders, which can be good for bus turnouts. Some weaknesses. There's not enough safe places for pedestrian crossings. Wide lanes are causing faster traffic. There are lighting issues along the corridor. Meeting openings create potential conflicts. And there's a lack of bicycle and pedestrian accommodations. Opportunities. Um, there's opportunities for improved bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, for improved landscaping and lighting, for future developments along the corridor, and even the potential for electric vehicle charging stations. Some threats that were outlined, wide openings are not safe for all users and create room for conflict. There's some mixed public perceptions of bicycle and pedestrian safety. And the current design of Route 6 is generally in conflict with the use of Route 6. The crowdsource mapping exercise that we went through is publicly available for anyone to submit site-specific comments regarding any and all issues or suggestions regarding travel by car, bicycle, foot, transit, or other potential transportation impacts along the corridor. We conducted this exercise with our participating stakeholders and received the most comments on the travel by car and the travel by foot maps, of which I've summarized on this slide. When traveling by car, some of the comments were the speed limit is too high for this area. Curb cuts and median opening designs are outdated and it's dangerous to cross Route 6 from one side street to another. When traveling by foot, some of the comments were 
Cars are moving too fast for, for pedestrians to cross safely. We need to continue adding new sidewalks. The current sidewalks are not ADA compliant and pedestrians need safer places to wait for the bus. We will be revisiting this map later on in the workshop to collect your feedback as well. To ensure that as many folks as possible could learn about the study in our workshops, we reached out to the public in a variety of ways. We established a project webpage for the corridor study where you can learn all about the purpose of the study, upcoming events, review current findings, view interactive maps, and participate in surveys. We posted flyers at local businesses along Route 6 and in both the Dartmouth and Westport town halls and local libraries. And lastly, we've also used social media to advertise both the study itself and the public workshops. We do have some early findings we'd like to share with you. For the physical layout, the travel lanes are average, varying roughly between 11 to 12 feet, which are generally appropriate for the corridor's current use, given the number of buses and trucks traveling along the corridor. The width of the painted shoulder varies greatly, anywhere from uh, one foot or less to as wide as 12 feet in some places. There are numerous areas that naturally create higher speeds, Given the wide 25-foot median, some sections with wide shoulders, higher speed limits, and a lack of development. There are several T-style, skewed T, and right angle intersections. And the drainage system has issues. Many of the catch basins are in need of clearing. For vehicle traffic, Vehicle speeds along the corridor can make entering and exiting the roadway challenging and dangerous for people driving cars, let alone pedestrians and people riding bicycles. And for multimodal, the lack of separation from travel, lane, travel lanes makes walking feel dangerous. Much of the sidewalk, sidewalks along the corridor are right up against the travel lane. And sidewalks where they are present are mainly in poor condition, are not connected to one another, end abruptly and vary in width greatly. Very few segments of the sidewalks are ADA compliant and would be very difficult for those in wheelchairs or anyone pushing strollers. Bicycling on this roadway is dangerous and generally not recommended. And the lack of bus shelters and safe areas to wait for the bus make it difficult for those traveling by transit. Now I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Sarah Brown, so she can present some maps she has prepared for you all today to and, and to explain some of the existing conditions along the corridor. Take it away, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Following what Greg was talking about, the physical layout, we also looked deeper at these nine intersections along Route 6. Five of them are stop controlled, with the exception of the Route 88 interchange, which has some stop signs and yield signs. And then four of them are, are controlled by traffic signals. On the left-hand side, you can see the streets that are listed for stop controlled and traffic signals. In August this year, we put out traffic counters along the corridor for a week at a time at each location. The first piece of data collected was traffic volume. The traffic volumes are the average daily traffic, including both the westbound and eastbound sides of the road. The average daily traffic count in Westport ranged between 12,000 and 13,000 vehicles per day, and the average in Dartmouth was between 16,000 and 20,000 per day. Most traffic went through re most traffic went through the Reed Road intersection. This next map shows the 85th percentile speed. The 85th percentile is the speed at or below which 85% of all vehicles observed to travel under free flowing conditions past the traffic counters. The fastest travel speed was recorded under the Route 88 overpass and the slowest travel speed were throughout the town of Dartmouth. The traffic counters were placed before and after the intersections, which could have caused a slower speed with this, as you can tell with the smaller dots.
This poll is just a which do you prefer poll. We want to know what you think about speeds throughout the route. Would you like slower traffic, more pedestrian and bicycle access, more and better bus stops and more businesses, or would you like faster traffic, less access, significant separation between modes and no new buildings? There are still a few people who haven't taken the poll, so if you would like to take it, um, please do so. All right, I'm gonna end the poll. 89% would like slower traffic, more pedestrian and bicycle access, better bus stop and more businesses throughout the corridor. Next, we're gonna look at um, some crash data. Between 2017 and 2019, there were 366 accidents. Two thirds of these crashes resulted in property damage only. Less than 1% resulted in a fatality. And there was a total of three of those throughout the quarter. One close to the Fall River line, one close to the Westport Dartmouth town line, and one in the middle stretch of Dartmouth. There's a question in the poll. Okay. Throughout this time period, there were three pedestrian and one bicycle involved crashes. 30% of the crashes were single vehicle crashes. 8% were collisions with the utility pole. And 26%, and 26 crashes or 7% were due to road conditions such as icy, wet, or snow. Go back one, Greg. Sorry about that. All right, this map shows the crash rates in the posted speed limits. When we looked at the crash rates for the intersections, we look at all the crashes within 250 feet of the, of the center of the intersection. The black number above the red dot are the total number of crashes at these locations. 38% of the 366 accidents happened in the intersections. This map shows the bicycle, pedestrian, and transit networks. The bicycle networks are the green and blue lines you can see throughout Westport and Dartmouth. The green lines display the existing and proposed off-road separate use paths, and the blue lines display existing and proposed on-road bicycle lanes. The red and orange lines display the sidewalks, and the light purple lines White purple line is the third intercity bus route between New Bedford and Fall River, and they are in the purple dots show the 56 stops along the portion of Route 6 with the one transit shelter to the east of Route 177. This map shows the sidewalk conditions. Last week, a few of us went and walked the sidewalks along Route 6 and conducted the sidewalk analysis. There are only 5.9 miles of sidewalks out of the possible 14.2 miles that there could be sidewalks along this stretch of the road. 0.3 miles were in excellent condition, 0.7 miles 
we're in good condition. 2.3 miles are in fair condition and 2.6 miles are in poor condition. 83% of the sidewalks are in less than good condition. The sidewalks range between 33 inches to 114 inches wide. And lastly, we have the land use. When we looked at land use, we looked at the parcels that were either touching Route 6 or were within 200 feet of the roadway. Here you can see the top three land use types throughout the corridor. And the first one being the institutional properties making up 27%. These include parcels owned by the West Portland Conservation, the town of Westport, the city of Fall River, the town of Dartmouth, and also churches. The second were commercial properties making up almost 22%, but this encompasses 109 parcels. The next was vacant at almost 18%. These three land categories make up 66% of the land use types throughout the quarter. The other 33% were made up of residential, mixed use, open space and recreation parcels, as well as apartments and office buildings. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> Let's recap some of what we've heard tonight so far. The study area starts at the Fall River City Line in Westport and ends at Cross Road in Dartmouth. There are nine intersections total along the corridor, four with traffic lights and five with stop signs. Much of the corridor is without sidewalks. The segments with sidewalks that do exist are mostly in fair to poor condition. There are no bicycle facilities along the corridor at all, nor is it currently particularly safe for anyone to ride a bike along many stretches of the corridor. And there are 56 public transit stops and only one bus shelter, many of which are precariously located. And vehicle speeds, whether at or below the speed limit, can make entering and exiting the roadway challenging and dangerous for you, even for mo other motorists, let alone anyone on foot or on bicycle. Before we get into the activities, I would just like to issue a couple of quick polls. The first of these being, do you live on Route 6 or in one of the neighborhoods along it? You can answer, I live on Route 6. You can answer, I live on one of the neighborhoods along it, or no, I do not. All right, we got 11% are two folks that live right on Route 6, 42% are eight folks who live in one of the neighborhoods along it, and nine of which are joining us as well. Thank you. This next question has to do with frequency of travel along Route 6. How often do you typically drive or ride on Route 6 from the Westport Fall River town line to Cross Road in Dartmouth? You can answer never, once per week, two to three times per week, four to five times per week, or more than five times per week. All right. Great mix of results. The vast majority of you do travel 106, which is good to hear. <laughs> uh, seven folks are 33% uh, are once per week. Um, we got a one person that's about two to three times, three people that are four to five times, and nine people that travel on Route 6 and within the study area more than five times per week. This next question has to do with modes of travel. 
Do you ever walk, bike, or take the bus along Route 6? You can choose multiple of these answers uh, between walking, biking, busing, or you can select one of the above. Excuse me. All right. So we got a few folks that walk, a few folks that bike. No one here takes the bus. And the rest of us are none of the above. Thank you all for participating in those uh, polls. It helps us get to know you all a little bit better. And uh, helps us understand your connection to the corridor. But now it's for the main event. Let's explore any uh, current or potential issues and opportunities along the corridor. We're gonna do this by discussing issues that you have or have witnessed while traveling along the corridor and some ideas you have for the future of the corridor. Then by utilizing our crowdsource map to place points along Route 6, we can highlight location specific issues faced by motorists, pedestrians, people riding bicycles and transit, and overall transportation impacts. But let's start with collecting some issues and ideas. All right. So this exercise will work by you all raising your hands as you have an issue or idea you'd like to point out and I'll place your suggestions accordingly. Feel free to chime in if you have uh, encountered the same issue or have the same idea as somebody else. There's, there's nothing wrong with saying the same thing twice. It, in fact, it just helps us to drive the point home. Once you've all shared some of your ideas with us, um, we will use those ideas to create a survey online that the public can participate in to rank the importance of all the issues and ideas so we can make recommendations to the towns based on your feedback. So I've provided a couple of examples just to kick things off. Um, so under issues, I put traffic moves too fast. Or under ideas, I put let's build better sidewalks. Um, now that being said, uh, feel free to turn your cameras back on, uh, unmute yourself, um, and raise your hand or type into the chat when you have an idea for the board, and we will call on you. Hey, Greg, I, I can speak on uh, what I said at the last uh, meeting for Dartmouth, and that would be reflectors at the uh, turnarounds. They're hard to see at night specifically. And I said this at the last meeting, people like me, but there are other people that have night blindness too, so that may help. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Gail. All right, I see that Sarah has her hand up. Hi, um, I travel often um, from Beaton Road through that um, reworked intersection where it enters Route 6 very often. And even though it seems neater, um, the space became even wider and I've had even more trouble entering Route 6 now than before they did the work on it. So I'm not sure how that helps for me from Beaton Road onto Route 6 going west, it's much worse and harder to get through that intersection. Forgive me, I can't recall the spelling of, of that road. I think I it's two P's. P, yeah. E-N, I think, yeah. I don't know, actually. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Slipped my mind there. And is that when you're uh, riding a bicycle, driving? 
but usually, usually I'm driving. driving. I, I, I find it difficult driving. It's um, just, just, I don't know. It's just made it worse. Made it harder. I think it, I don't know. I'm not a planner. I don't know. I'm not a planner. We're trying to fix it, but it's worse for me and me. Thank you for that, Sarah. Jim, I see your question in the chat um, regarding the width of the right of way. I don't, I don't have that off the top of my head um, at this moment, but it, that, that's definitely information that we have pretty quick access to and we'd be able to answer. All right, Manny, I see you got your hand up. One of the one of the big problems that I see on a daily basis is the crossovers. People trying to switch direction, and ninety percent of the time, the motorists don't understand what side of the road they're supposed to be on, and they end up blocking the line of sight coming up the opposite direction. So it's folks trying to do U turns. Yes, or well, even cut off into other businesses. Yes. So people trying to cross over Route 6, whether or not to do a U-turn or to go into a business, um, there's, there's some issues there and potential conflicts. They end up blocking lanes and, and otherwise. You also have, have people stopping technically in the high speed lane to wait to get in there. So people are running down Route 6 and many of the accidents have been occurred that way. Thank you for that, Manny. Jim, I see your hand is up. You're up. Okay, I would like to reiterate what Manny was talking about with the crossovers. When I cross through one of those to either turn left or turn around, I whether I'm in Westport or Dartmouth, I don't know if I'm supposed to go to the end of the turnaround or the beginning of the turnaround. Um, and it's very confusing and I think it's dangerous. And then I have no idea whether my, the back end of my car is sticking out into the traffic. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, jumping in on that point as well. That's a definitely a common issue that we've heard brought up a lot. We also heard that from the folks in Dartmouth. So I see Heidi in the chat um, said traffic needs to be slowed down. And from Bob, the ramp from Route 88 to Route 6 is very dangerous uh, with the high speed merge and no transition lane. Mary, I see you have your hand up. You're up. Um, I wanted to throw out an idea regarding those turnarounds um, and U-turn sure. areas. Um, I would definitely second the, the uh, idea of the reflectors um, because even without night blindness, I'm sure many people cannot see when those turns are coming up. Um, but also I, I wonder if either of those islands can go away and they become a third lane for people to pull into and wait to turn um, and or just an, air, an indented area that I see in some places, but not all down the road where the person who wants to make the U-turn can go into a, a lane and wait their turn not half in, half out of this bizarre turnaround section. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, those, those medians are 25 feet wide um, in most places. So there's, there's plenty of room to work with in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so there's a lot of potential for, for repurposing those areas, absolutely. Lauren, I see that your hand is up. You're up next. Hi, I was just thinking, I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm thinking about the turnarounds. There's one in particular when you are heading from Crossroad and it would be south. And if you wanted to take a U-turn there, I've seen people with large vehicles not being able to make that turn and having to put their car in reverse for a few seconds to make that full U-turn there. And the other thing I wanted to just observe is the extent of the sidewalks. Um, when I started thinking about this, one day I just started to look at where the sidewalks were located and I was extremely disappointed. There is a section, it isn't Dartmouth, but I'm gonna mention it. Like when there's a lot of snow and the snow plows come by, there's nowhere for people to walk. And after a snowstorm, pedestrians that would normally be using the sidewalk or at least be off the highway, this is for all of Route 6, end up walking in the street when there's snow on the ground. That's definitely a huge issue that, that should be resolved. Absolutely, thank you for bringing that up. I'm gonna make another comment. Um, Go for it. I lived over on Forge Road for quite some time. And those two intersections, the one that was mentioned before with the Beaton Route 177, the Highland Ave, how Highland come, Ave comes in there at a weird intersect, at a weird angle. And then you also have Forge. Mm -hmm. There were accidents there all the time, constantly, always, um, always blocking off that intersection, having the traffic be rerouted around Forge Road, et cetera, et cetera, because the accidents are so bad there. I stopped driving straight from Highland under Route 6 because mm -hmm. of the speed at which people are coming around the Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. It is so dangerous. So I actually wrote on the board. Here's an idea, which would be to turn Highland Road into that little section between Forge and Route 6, to turn it into a one-way street so that nobody is trying to get onto Route 6 from that area. So that you could only go you would close off the eastbound traffic from the Forge Road intersection. So it would be a one-way street. Thank you for that idea. Gregory, it's, it's Forge Road, not Highland oh, Road. Sorry about that. Well, it is Highland Road. Right. It is the Highland Route 6 intersection. Are you proposing making Highland a one-way or Forge? Highland. Highland. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I, um, I could see how the other way could work. Well, thank you for that, Lauren. Uh, Manny, your hand's back up. What you got for us? And back at that intersection next to Lincoln Park in 177, and I guess it was a few years back that Mass Highway those improvements to, um, drainage and they put the lights and the break off curb and stuff. But it, uh, wasn't there some improvements that are, are still supposed to be made from the 40 yard development that was going over there? I, I, had, I remember hearing years back that they were supposed to do some improvements into that, uh, that, that intersection that haven't been made yet. Do, do you know where that stands? I think I, oh, there we go. Thanks yeah, for that. I believe that any additional improvements will come from additional development at the Lincoln Park site. And there is conduit underground in place now. So when the traffic warrants it, a signal can be put in.
So I, I see a question in the chat uh, looking for some clarification uh, about what the reflectors would or could look like on the crossover areas by the medians um, regarding Gail, your, your previous uh, comment. And I know, and I think either Lauren or Mary also uh, double down on, on the reflectors, but if somebody, perhaps Gail, um, would like to just clarify for, for Sarah, uh, what exactly you mean by that, what they might look like. Okay, um, can you guys hear me? Absolutely. Okay, I lost the picture, but I can see you guys. Um, so, uh, you know, specifically driving um, home, usually from work and it, especially a night like this, and I'm driving the, on the road and I want to turn into, uh, I'm heading west and I want to turn into one of the, uh, you know, places on the, on the left. I, I find myself just driving and, and kind of squint, squinting and I'm in the left lane, so I'm going slower, but that's not really always, you know, a good idea. And I have to really almost come upon it to see where that that turn is for me to take that left. Um, it's not always. I mean, we had the hunter mood, and that was that was great. I could see no problem. There were even shadows. But I'm thinking of some kind of reflector um, post or something that would give you the indication that that is where you're going to be going into you'll see two of them and you'll be able to see that you're going in between them. And there was a gentleman on the last meeting in Dartmouth that came up from North Carolina. And he was saying down there, they have already have that in place down there. So um, he was used to seeing that down there and surprised when we got up here that he didn't see it here. Thank you for that clarification, Gail. And Sarah says, thank you too, in the chat. <laughs> and I see uh, David made a comment in the chat. Many people now use Route 6 as a high speed roadway rather than staying on I-195. More traffic lights and much slower speed limits would discourage this. Let me make sure I record that. This one's kind of funny because it's both issues and ideas. So I'm gonna put it right in the middle. It looks like it lives there. Good spot. Uh, Rob in the chat asks, what can we do about slowing down traffic on Route 6 between Ford Road and Route 177? The speed is 35, but no one does it. Um, I might have some ideas regarding that, Rob. Um, there's a lot of different traffic calming measures that can be implemented on any roadway to, to slow down traffic. Because you can put a speed limit on a road all you want. Uh, a sign isn't gonna slow anybody down as, as we all have witnessed and probably participated in ourselves at different points in our lives driving on roadways. But um, so some simple traffic calming uh, measures include uh, decreasing the width of the roadway, taking away a lane, um, adding other um, potential uses like uh, bikes or wider sidewalks, anything that can essentially shorten the crossing distance and narrow the space to impose a feeling of needing to pay a lot more attention on the driver. Um, the Route 6 was built like a highway. It's built a lot more like 195 is than it is like a residential street. And that's why people treat it like a highway. And so until Route 6 is redesigned and rebuilt, no one's ever gonna go 35 miles an hour on that road. And that's just the, the truth of the matter. I do see that some hands are up. Um, but I'm not sure if they were up before or not. I see Mary, Lauren, and Sarah. Okay, Sarah's is still up. Thank, thanks for the clarification, Lauren. And 
uh, Mary. Sarah, go ahead. Um, I, as far as ideas go, I would, to your comment about it, Route 6 is built like a highway, um, I would like to see some more landscapings. If, if we're going to keep those medians in the center, plant some trees, some other bushes and things, and, and make it more boulevard-like, um, I think that goes a long way to making it feel less like a highway. Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely another way of kind of changing the, the look of the roadway and kind of imposing a different feeling on the roadway as well. Yeah, I see a comment from Lauren here. Would insulation of sidewalks on each side alleviate the speed potentially um, in a couple of different ways? One being, as I was kind of hinting at before, regarding the built environment, if you narrow the roadway in any way, it causes, it has been proven to cause drivers to move slower because they have to pay more attention and they don't feel like they have as much room. That's why lanes on the highway are so much wider um, and than our local uh, streets. And it's to encourage uh, faster driving and safer faster driving in that exact atmosphere. But we don't want to build uh, this road like a highway or you know, it shouldn't be anyway. Um, and so not only does the sidewalk by way of um, decreasing the width of, of the roadway uh, help visually, but also just by getting more people walking and biking and creating um, a more lively and livable atmosphere, more people on the roadway, that also slows people down. And that's just human nature. Nobody wants to run over a pedestrian. Nobody wants to come into physical contact with a pedestrian while they're driving an automobile. And so if there's more people walking along the roadway on sidewalks, crossing over crosswalks and the like, that kind of activity can absolutely slow down traffic just by way of folks caring about one another and caring about one another's safety. So I see a couple uh, comments, another one. Yes, wildflowers and trees by Julie. Thanks for uh, doubling down on the, the landscaping comment, Julie. Uh, Sandra, MassDOT is studying Route 18 in New Bedford to connect neighborhoods, add bike and pedestrian accommodations, green space, and slow the traffic. Sandra posted a link in the chat. Thank you for that. And then we have Greg uh, Chaunt, I believe it's pronounced. I, I live on Route 6. I've seen a lot of roadways uh, put in roundabouts to slow traffic. Um, so maybe this would slow down folks uh, speeding on Route 6. Perhaps it could. Roundabouts can kind of work both ways though, um, because they do allow for a continuous movement of automobiles. So it can be safer for cars, not necessarily safer for people. Um, and it doesn't necessarily slow people down a lot. I mean, it will slow people down, but not necessarily as much as say, coming to a complete stop or lower speed limits in a different built environment. Not saying it's a bad idea though, roundabouts definitely have their place and very well could have their place on this uh, corridor. Thank you for that comment. I'm gonna record it on here. Right in the idea section. Thank you for that, Greg. Lauren's got another issue here. The crossroad intersection gets very built up the eastbound on crossroad approaching Route 6. Thank you. And just as a reminder, we are going to um, take a look at a map in a few moments, and we're going to be able to pinpoint some of these uh, location specific issues as well. 
Um, so feel free to be as specific as you want in these issues I, and, and ideas uh, as you'd like. Also paint with a broad brush because um, in, in just a couple of minutes, I'm gonna give it another four or five minutes or so uh, of commenting on, on the issues and ideas before we switch over to the map. Oh, I see. Jim, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I have one uh, uh, issue, uh, and I, I hope it's a uh, an issue that can be addressed when when they redo Route Six. Uh, during dur during the past few years, we've had a study called the Targeted Integrated Water Resource Management Plan. And also uh, before that, uh, we had a, a, a report from, uh, from UMass Dartmouth uh, Mar Mar Marine Sciences uh, School uh, outlining our TMDLs, our total daily uh, loads that are uh, in the watershed. And it's for nitrogen mostly. We have also same thing for bacteria. But the one of the biggest, not the biggest, but one of the major contributors to the nitrogen load in the river system is stormwater. And the stormwater structures in the Route 6 corridor are old. Uh, they basically, I believe, uh, just dump into streams and wetlands along the way. And if we're going to be redoing Route 6, we really need to have uh, a new stormwater system so that we're not dumping uh, contaminated water directly into the streams that go directly into the east branch of the river. This is a serious issue. And um, I would say MassDOT has not been totally receptive to doing it on 177 when they redid some of the uh, uh, stormwater infrastructure on that road. Uh, it really uh, did not get cleaned and it still dumps into the East Branch. And I think that including if we're going to get any economic development in some of the areas of Route 6, we really need the ability for adjacent lots, especially because of the topography, to be able to tie into the stormwater system. And I know this isn't part of a traffic study but it's part of the the thinking about what to do with route six it really needs to be addressed and i don't know if we could write something into this that mass thought would see i would appreciate it well, i think you just did jim uh, we're officially recording this so this will absolutely uh, be included in the study um, to some extent and uh, any and all resources or information that can be sent our way regarding this issue we'll gladly take a look at and to whatever extent is possible, we will include it in the study as well. Um, you know, it, like, you, like you pointed out, it's a part of the road infrastructure and automobiles uh, driving along the roadway, I imagine and assume uh, contribute to that pollution as well. Um, so I, I think it's a more than pertinent issue uh, to be brought up in the scope Correct. of the study, so thank you. Correct, and I think it's critical to both the health of the river and to future economic development uh, along Route 6. Absolutely. And I've seen um, a lot of water remediation and filtration systems that are relatively natural and built pretty seamlessly into the built environment as well via uh, swales and the like as well. Um, so I imagine that some things like that could perhaps be incorporated too, if it were to make sense. I mean, I, I imagine it's a it's an issue of scale and to what extent those things can actually mitigate and remediate uh, those pollutants entering the the watershed. So I think and that's, that's one of the reasons why I asked about the width of the right of way. Mm -hmm. Did you see the response to that in the uh, chat earlier? I, th I think one of our staff may have replied. If not, I think the I think it was a 
between 85 and 100 feet in most places. Okay. So there should be room for some of this uh, stormwater infrastructure. Um, I would think, I mean, if the, the right of ways is that wide and the traveled way on each side is 25 feet, maybe. Yeah, give or take. Give or take, so. And it's should... a 25 foot median as well. So we're talking nearly 50 feet or, or, or more across, you know. But there are places along the Route 6 corridor that would be suitable for this, uh, even if it isn't land that is owned by the state at the moment, that is not developed, um, that could be used for, for rain gardens and uh, catchment swales and all kinds of things. So. I see a couple of, well, th thank you for sleep. Uh, for that gem and Mandy, I'm going to call on you next. I just uh, I want to address a couple of things I, I saw in the chat. Um, I see uh, Julie posted, can you assure residents that there will be no yardage taken from lawns in front of houses along Route 6 as sidewalks are added and lane sizes are changed? Um, that would be in the purview of the town and MassDOT to answer that question. We are, as, as an entity, SERPED is here to create a study and make recommendations. Um, I will say that given the current width of the actual roadway and the medians, uh, I can't see the need for taking, and I, I can't see us recommending uh, the taking of, of anyone's front lawns for the use of sidewalks, considering how much room there already is in the roadway. Um, but you know, there's nuance to be had in every conversation, and you know, uh, I, I I can't say with a hundred percent certainty that every single property is going to fall under that exact scenario. But as I said, I I can't really foresee us recommending the taking of anyone's front lawns uh, for that purpose, given the the current width of the roadway. Um, I hope that. Uh, at least reassures you uh, a bit there, Julie. <laughs> um, Manny. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to just agree with um, Jim Witten. I'm, I'm also on the planning board with Jim that he chairs. Um, I live the back entrance to my property is off of Route 6. Mm -hmm. My family's traveled Route 6 probably for 100 years. My grandmother grew up on Fort Road. So I got all the stories about trolley cars and all that on Route 6. One of them, one of our, the infrastructure is a major problem, not just the storm drainage. The town's presently undertaking um, the design for, for the sewer. Um, but one of the, an even larger problem that I see with the storm drainage in the sewer would be the portable water. We have many, many houses and residents along Route 6 that's well as a contaminant. There's you know, a person that spoke in the chat here. He's got a well that's probably 15 feet off of Route 6. That's Many of these wells were, you know, salt from sand in the streets and so forth. I mean, a piece of a piece of water main was was extended in from forever in the 80s. I mean, nothing has been looped in or anything since then. So I, I think any improvements to the to the traffic patterns on Route 6, we gotta we gotta address all of these infrastructure before we do any, any pavement or anything like that. Um, I just like to know if we, I did see that Mass Highway conducted a, an entire survey of the um, corridor last summer. And I would imagine that means that they're planning some type of project in the near future. As, as I stated, being on the planning board, we're planning to um, install sewer. So I would just would hope that possibly we could have a little bit more communication between Mass Highway District 5 in the town and Serpid. Maybe we can get a dialogue going so we can, we can move forward with this. Thank you for that, Manny.
Sarah. Hi. Um, one other area where I um, am frequently uncomfortable driving, and thankfully I don't ride my bike over this, or it would be even worse. But um, going east from Fall River towards right before I would get to White of Westport, it, I try very hard not to be in that right lane because it's just a curb and a wall or something, and I'm always afraid I'm going to get smash to the right or hit my tire on a curb so i try my best to be in the left lane there it just the curve is too too tight and the um and the curb is too close to the, the traffic driving lane way thank you sarah Does this note paraphrase that well? Going east from Fall River towards White's, the right lane feels dangerous. The curb is too tight and too close to the travel lane. Yep, that's good. Awesome. All right, well, this is all wonderful feedback. These are a lot of important issues, a lot of great ideas. I really appreciate the enthusiasm. Um, it's, it's very evident uh, how important this corridor and this study area is to all of you uh, participating um, in tonight's workshop. I wanna now switch over to the crowdsource map and get a little bit more specific about where some of the issues are and ideas are could be located along the corridor. Um, and so for this exercise, just as before, you can raise your hand uh, and I can place a pin on the map for you, or you can open the map for yourself on another page of your browser at a point yourself, and then raise your hand to inform us about which point you placed and why. Uh, the link to the map uh, was posted in the chat earlier and we can we can pop it in there again so that way you have quicker access to it um and so just to break down this exercise a little bit more and to to kind of give everyone a clearer idea about how it works uh we have a few different categories here uh you can leave a comment in regards to traveling by car traveling by foot traveling by bicycle traveling by transit or some general transportation impacts um, in regards to, say, the stormwater issue. Um, under transportation impacts, if we were to leave a comment, we can select the category flooding and drainage issues, speeding, air quality issues, noise issues. And we can zoom in and place a comment anywhere we want on this map. Um, in the same respect, traveling by car. Um, if we leave a comment, we can choose categories around safety issues, conflict with other modes, maintenance issues, frequent congestion, or other, a, a different idea or comment altogether. And say, traveling by bicycle. The categories are such, safety issues, crossing issues, conflict with other modes, access to businesses or services, new paths or lanes needed, streetscaping, like bike parking, shade trees, lighting, etc., maintenance issues or other. Um, so like I said, feel free to pop your hand up if you want me to place a pin on the map for you. Um, or you can follow the link that uh, my colleague Sarah posted in the chat. You can also post it for yourself. I would just ask that if you are gonna post one uh, during the course of the meeting, the next few minutes, uh, just raise your hand after you uh, pop it in there, just so you can tell us about where you put it in one. That way we can kind of, you know, continue to share with each other. Gregory, there's a couple of added comments. You may want to um, oh, yep. put those on the map. There's one about uh, walking um, in that same area that was previously referenced, that curve there near White's. OK. 
Okay. Would you mind doing me a favor and uh, just reading it to me while I'm placing it down on here? Yeah. Would it be categorized as a safety issue, crossing issue? You can let me know. Um, you can do safety. I think the, the first comment was um, in reference to riding a bicycle, but the area is offered for pedestrians. Um, I'm sorry, can you clarify the, the pedestrian comment? That the area is awful. Ah. <laughs> the area is awful for pedestrians. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I can't imagine enjoying going for a stroll over here either. So just at that curve, at that curve, right, where Sarah was kind of describing earlier, Right, right, which connects to the um, bike path eventually. So, yeah. Yep, over on the uh, western side of the line there. All right, I'll place that pin. And then you said there was a comment for bicyclists as well, right? That was verbally, uh, you put that on your um, board there, Gregory. Oh, uh, yep. So, there's one other comment in the chat as well, and it's about the shop turn at 11.99 slash 1201 State Road, um, cause driving into the curb at the, every month, basically. So I think that's near, let me see who made that comment. Julie made that comment. And I think that might be near Highland and Forge, that area. Exactly. It's, um, it's right where, as you're driving down Route 6, everyone goes, oh my God, there's a turn. And um, they just drive so close to the sidewalk that they're really um, typically, you know, just drive their tire right into the curb. <laughs> kind of where that little red dot is. It's just a little bit past Forge Road, like, and before it's between Forge Road and 177. I, I can't quite see it on the map. Yeah, so we got Forge Road right here. Yep. Right where that corner is, where, yep, I'm right near the red dot, you're right. Awesome. All right, so. So cars are driving into the curb, Gregory. Mm -hmm. I might have to put that as a, maybe a transportation impact. Because it's kind of a, Strange issue here. So I'm going to put it just generally right about here. I'm going to copy and paste that, that comment directly on here. Got it. Thank you for that, Julian. One other comment, Gregory, that was previously made, um, I don't believe we recognized was at the crossroad intersection. Mm -hmm. And would it be by car, foot, bicycle, transit? Um, I believe it would be by car. And it's um, the comment is the crossroad intersection gets very built up the eastbound on cross approaching Route 6. Hmm. It's an issue of congestion over here at Crossroad. Just gotta wait for the map to load. There we go. Frequent congestion. Um, I apologize. Would you be able to reiterate? I think you you said something in in regards to a was it the left turn lane or uh, the crossroad yeah. intersection gets very built up. The eastbound on cross approaching Route Six. Oh, okay.
Thank you. I also see there's confusion driving west approaching the intersection at Reed Road. People still want to use the far right lane to turn on the light, even with signage. Let me make sure I get that in here. Thank you for that, Julie. So I see a comment, get rid of the bend between Forge Road and Union Ave. Uh, Rob, would you, would you mind uh, describing that a, a little bit more? Um, if not in the chat, you can turn your microphone on and I'll elaborate a little bit. Maybe he means to straighten it out. Um, yeah, I'm talking about between Forge and Union Ave. Yeah. Uh, the way the bend, where you go, where Highland Ave meets Route Six. Yeah. That, that area is horrible for accidents. Uh, it's supposed to be 35 miles an hour, and people going 55 miles an hour, and they're constantly hitting that cur that corner. Why can't they just do away with that bend? It's it's probably been there since the 1800s. Uh, there's still cobblestones in front of uh, my house. Um, as, if they could do away with it completely and, and somehow move the Route 6 over a little, that that passes there because it's ridiculous. Uh, it's the worst part of Route 6. when it, uh, uh, It's supposed to be slowed down and people still go 55 miles an hour and it's just, it's ridiculous. So, so I just want to make sure I, I just want to make sure I place it on the map correctly. Um, Rob, where uh, the red dot was originally. So, like right, right here at the this Correct. little side that road. Bend right there. Yeah, you got Highland Avenue, and yep. then you got State Road. That bend right there is shop. It's literally yeah. right on the property of eleven ninety nine and twelve oh one. Where where it had to be, we had to file a we had to uh, um, uh, file a complaint because uh, there were, it had so many potholes there originally, and it was down to the cobblestone. Um, it would shake the whole house. It was so bad um, that uh, I, I can't see why they can't move that over or straighten that van out. And the suggestion earlier about that one way on Highland Avenue, that was, that was a great idea as well. Just, just uh, cause it, it just, it, it's just, it's an accident waiting to happen. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. So I see a, a comment here in the chat from David. Uh, economics and good planning is likely to lead future development of the Route 6 corridor to become mainly a residential area with denser housing, including multi-story apartment buildings, such as recently added to Lincoln Park. Existing mini strip wall, malls may well be transformed to serve more local residential customers. This should lead to Route 6 becoming a residential boulevard with local service establishments. I'm going to throw this one back on that previous page for ideas. I definitely think that's worth recording. Thank you very much for that, David. Um, 
whole thing didn't get to get covered over because it's a little long. So such a recent. I'm gonna put that in two two sticky notes. There we go. Got it. Thank you for that, David. And David, your, your comment actually gets uh, back to that first poll question even um, that we asked about speed, you know, because there's, there's certain things that kind of need to occur to create that more like boulevard or like village-esque um, look and feel uh, for an area that you're kind of describing. And so like slowing the traffic down better bicycle and pedestrian access, more and better bus stops, more businesses in those areas. Um, you mentioned denser uh, residential housing and the like. Um, that's absolutely a, a, a great portrait for one of the options uh, that the town could go for, for either a segment of Route 6, a larger stretch. I mean, you name it. I mean, it, it is, I mean, this is your roadway as a community. so when we're having these conversations like illustrating that kind of a, a vision and the different components about it is super important and and talking a little bit more about maybe where some of those things could go is also super helpful as well um some of this stuff was actually uh, there's a study uh from 2005 listed on the the corridor studies webpage that you can check out um that actually breaks down some of these very points that, that you're making and we're discussing right now as well. Uh, Manny, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I'd just like to, to, to agree with David. I think a lot of people in town believe that's the direction that we should go. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm familiar with that study um, from, I think it was like 15 years ago. But yeah, <laughs> about 16. <laughs> so the ideas back then, were, they're, they're still good. <laughs> We gotta just stop, stop studying and get it done. That's oh, it. Sound it was really good. Hey, you, you said it, man. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I, I think that those are some some really wonderful ideas. Uh, Lauren, I see your hand is up. Hi. Thanks. Um, yeah, let's admit there's a lot of problems, um, but I, I have this idea and I think this is the right room to speak about it. This, the South Watapa and the waterfront at the north end of Route 6, where after Whites of Westport, it remains two lanes. And frankly, we don't really need four lanes in that section of Route 6. Why not pairing it, pair it down, extend the Quickishan Rail Trail, which is amazing, into Westport and develop that area as a waterfront park. That's an awesome suggestion. So that's my pie in the sky idea. I don't think it sounds too pie in the sky. People have done wilder things in other places. It, so it, used, it used to be that way. Sorry, uh, Jim, was that you chiming in? Yeah, I was just saying that it used to be that way back in the 20s of the last century, 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh, there were uh, boat concessions along there. Um, there were restaurants. Uh, it was quite a place. That sounds beautiful. Um, Lauren and, and Manny, forgive me if I if I didn't notice, I, I can't tell if your hands are newly up or if they're just still up. Thank you. 
All right, I think now would be a, a good time to wrap up this, this portion of, of the activities and, and questions. Um, you all provided a lot of awesome feedback. Um, again, just to reiterate, uh, you can follow the link in the chat. You can also find this map on our website and participate in it at any time. Um, so don't hesitate to do so. Uh, the more comments we can get on this before the end of the study in spring of um, 2022, the better. Um, they're all going to be included in, in the study. Uh, Sarah, I see your hand up. I just wonder, is it, are, are you going to transfer the sticky note comments to this map or at some point is it, or is it worth me going back later to put any comments I made on this, during that activity onto this map? Are they all, is, is that important or, or you, have you already captured it? If, if there was a site specific comment that you had made on the sticky note activity, um, it would surely be helpful uh, for anyone who made a site specific comment that was reported there to go ahead and place a point on the map on their own as well. Um, just to ensure that it doesn't get overlooked. We're, we're going to record all those things officially. Um, it's just not necessarily in the workflow to then take those and, and move them over to the map. Um, I'm not saying we won't necessarily do it, but if you do have some of those points, I mean, there's there's no harm in, in more than one point addressing the same issue ending up on the map. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. That was a good question. All right, folks. Well, this round of public meetings will be concluding uh, phase one of our study. Uh, and during phase two, we're going to be conducting all analysis for the study. We're gonna be holding our second round of stakeholder meetings, developing recommendations based on our analysis and community input, holding a second round of public workshops, and then compiling everything we've learned and developed into a final report to share with the general public and town officials in both Westport and Dartmouth. So on the note of that, this concludes our meeting today. Uh, thank you again for taking part in the study with us. We're looking forward to providing you with updates and products along the way. Please be sure to visit the study's uh, page on our website. And please, please do not hesitate to contact me via email at any time regarding this study. Um, on the note of that, enjoy the rest of your night, folks. And thank you again so much for coming tonight. Everyone's gone.